record chat better perfect perfect all right let me get one more thing up here real quick oh righty so what did we learn last time Correlation does not equal causation. Exactly. And what does that mean in layman's terms? If you were going to describe that to grandma, what does that mean? It means that um, just because um, the data is correlated. Yeah, just because there's a relationship in the data doesn't mean that one variable is causing the other variable, right? And so ice cream sales and shark attacks are correlated. Probably not the case. Shark attacks are causing ice cream sales to go up or ice cream sales going up probably not causing uh, shark attacks. What else did we learn? Um, we learned about Spearman correlation. Okay, and what is the Spearman correlation? Um, just when you have to use the ranks to... Exactly, yes. So a Spearman is ranks. Right. So we're going to go through and rank our X data, and then we're going to start over and rank our Y data. And we're making sure we're ranking consistently. Best standard practice is smallest number gets a one, and so on. Now, when I did the practice problem on uh, Canvas, um, I had it, so let's just say our X data was three, two, two, five. Um, Oh, just a second, I've learned it. Um, so um, I got, the way I did it was give it one, one, two, nope, excuse me, not two, one, one, three, four. That's how I did it. Um, technically, you're supposed to average the two values that would go here, so one and two. So instead of doing that, it should be 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.
that over or y rank. So we start off with the smallest number for x. So smallest number for x is two, so that gets rank one, then it goes to three, which is getting rank two, then it goes to four, which is rank three, and then it goes to five, which is rank four. So now we do our y rank. So our smallest is one, which gets a one. Our smallest is, our next smallest is two, which gets a rank two. Our next smallest is three, which gets a rank three. And our next smallest is five, which gets the rank four. So like if it Does that was, make sense, Sonny? Yeah, so like what you said was like if it was, if there were numbers that were the same, it would be just one point five for the both of them. Is that not what you one point five necessarily? In that case, it was one point five. But if I had um, let's say our x uh, is uh, you know one, two, 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 four. So I now have one, two, three, four, five, six data points, right? So the X rank, one would get the one, and then I have one, two, three, four twos, right? And so I need to encompass second, third, fourth, and fifth place for that. So I would average all of that together. So two plus three plus four plus five, three. So I'd get five, nine, 14 in there, 14 divided by four, gives me 3.5. And so then each of those twos would get ranked 3.5. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Okay. 3.5, and then four, we get six. Cool, good question. All right, let's move on to talking about regressions. But first, here's your fun fact of the day. Manish Sethi, a computer programmer, hired a woman at $8 an hour to slap him in the face every time he tried checking Facebook during work hours. I think we should all do something similar to that after watching The Social Dilemma. If you haven't watched that, I recommend you watch it. Um, Andrew, no, today is not a review session. Um, we're not having a review session, but I'll leave some time. I'll try to leave some time at the end of class if you all have any specific questions. All right, so today we're talking about that linear regression, right? When we talked about correlations on Monday, we talked about the linearity, right? We're looking at linear correlations or linear relationships. The linear regression is going to be a statistical procedure that determines the equation for a line that best fits the data. All right, and so last time when we were talking about correlations, we had, you know, data cloud of points here. And what we're going to be doing today is finding what is the slope of a line that would best fit that data, would be the best representation of that data in there. Now, why might we want to ever fit a regression line? What does that give us that just a pure correlation doesn't give us? I guess it kind of shows us that there is a correlation and like, how, how like close the correlation or how close the data might be to a correlation? Um, not quite. So us doing what we did on um, Monday was establishing whether or not there was a correlation, right? And how strong the correlation was, how uh, essentially tight fitting around a line that correlation would be. But the regression is going to allow us to forecast data, right? And so it's able to say that, okay, we only have X values up to this point, but let's say we were able to get X values up here. What should we expect that Y value to be, right? And so a regression line is going to allow us to provide some degree of forecasting into the future, but also make predictions about somebody's individual data point, right? Without that line, if we just look at this data here, Right? We can say, okay, given somebody's score on X, what should we predict on Y? And without a best fitting line, what we're doing is essentially just trying to guess. We'll say, eh, it'll probably be somewhere in here, so maybe there, right? But that's not precise, that's not statistical. And so what we're doing with this line is allowing us to actually predict somebody's specific values. And so any straight line 
can be represented by y equals bx plus a, where b and a are constants, and y and x corresponds to the data you have. All right, so b is that slope coefficient. Or that yeah, it's the same thing. Okay. Yeah. yeah, this should look very similar if you've ever done linear algebra. Yeah. <laughs> Just different notation. Yeah, so the value of B is called that slope constant, and it's going to determine the direction and the degree to which that line is tilted, which leaves A being that y-intercept, and will tell us at what point that line crosses y. So A will tell us how far up we should move that line, and B tells us what's the direction of that slope. So here's an example. I think this is just made up data. I don't know if the book actually got this from a study. But the relationship between SAT scores and GPA, all right, we have a certain pattern of data and we can see that is a generally positive correlation. But if we wanted to project what somebody's GPA would be if we know their SAT scores, or we know what their GPA is, we want to project what their SAT scores would be. Excuse me. We need to fit this regression line in there such that we can say, if you have a 2.5 GPA, we can predict that your SAT score would be about 550. On the math or whatever it is. So how well a set of data points fit that straight line can be measured by calculating the distance between the data points and the line. The total error between the data points and the line it's obtained by squaring each distance and then summing those squared values. The regression equation is designed to produce the minimum sum of squared errors. All right, so if we go back to this data point or to this line, this line right here is the line that minimizes the average distance of every individual data point to that line. So again, you're drawing every data point to that line. For every one of those, this is the line that best fits that data. So is that the right? same thing? You could thing imagine as... a line. That... Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, is that the same thing as the slope? I'm just trying to stay there. So no, the slope is the rise over the run, right? And so it's to what degree does that line move in that direction versus that direction versus that direction, et cetera. So, so the, the slope is just giving you the directionality of that line. Okay. Okay. So then you said right? that you could conceptually the, think that, the... yeah, you could conceptually think that if you just shifted this line up, you know, to up here, it still has the same slope, 
but it wouldn't be the best fit any longer. Okay. okay. And so, yeah. And so what we're doing here is establishing what is the line which minimizes the distance between all of these, all right? So again, you could have okay. a line that looked like that going through the data, but you're gonna have a lot of distance between every data point in that line. What we're doing is finding at what angle does that line need to be in addition to what is that um, Y uh, intercept to allow us to minimize that average distance. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So again, the equation for a regression line is represented by y hat equals bx plus a. Where x and y are the variables. And we calculate b by taking the sp value we calculated with the correlation and dividing that by the sum of squares of our x value. And we get our a constant by taking the mean of the y data minus that b we just calculated times the mean of x. And again, to get our SP, this is the equation we went over last time, the sum of XY, right? So you multiply X times Y minus the sum of X times the sum of Y divided by N gives you your SP. And then just to serve as a reminder, what is the equation for sum of squares? Exactly. Yes. So to get B, we first have to calculate the SP. And then we need the sum of squares for our X data. So let's go over an example real quick. So I have two different variables. Doesn't matter what they are. I have X and I have Y. The sum of X is 17. The sum of y is 25. When I multiply x by y to get xy, the sum of that is 104. I'm then going to take uh, the sum and divided by the n for x. So the mean of x is 3.4. The mean of y is 5. And then I went ahead and just calculated the sum of squares x and sum of squares y. You guys already know how to do that. Calculate it for ease here. And so now we have to get our SP value, right? So we're taking that sum of XY, that 104, and from that we're subtracting the sum of X minus. Oh crap. All right. All right. So we're subtracting from that. The sum of x times the sum of y divided by 5. And when we do all of that, we get 19. So that's our SP value. 
And if we wanted to find our correlation, what do we do from last time? Um, we would take our SP value and divide it by the square root of our sum of squares of X times our sum of squares of Y. Exactly. So you could do that and find that correlation. We won't waste time doing that now. But once we have our SP, we can then calculate our B, right? Our slope coefficient. So we take our SP, which is 19, calculate it down here. And we divide it by our sum of squares X, right? So 21.2. gives us 0.896. And then to find that Y intercept value, you're taking the mean of Y, from that you're subtracting the B value times the um, mean of X. gives you 1.95. So our regression line now can be represented by this equation. Y equals 0.896X plus 1.95. Um, yes, if the problem is that for the regression equation, yes. So what does that look like graph, right? So here are each of the data points from before. And this dotted blue line is our regression line. And here is the regression equation. And so if I wanted you to forecast and say, what is the value of y when x is zero? What would the answer be? Exactly, it would just be that y-intercept, right? So you can actually see if you were to continue on that line, you would get to 1.9528. The nice thing is, even though we don't have data for an x value of five, we can project what that would be, right? We can project what that y value would be. So that y equal to 0.89, oops, six times five plus at 1.9528. You're doing it. Six, whoops, 6.4338. So you can see if we go up from five, that corresponds to roughly six and a third, right? Six and a half, somewhere in between there. And so this gets really useful when we're trying to project data where we've got gaps in data or understand what data would look like at the extremes if we don't have that data. Or trying to forecast forward, right? So when you hear things like projected GDP growth for next quarter or things like that, what they're doing is looking at the data we have now and trying to project more months into the future what that growth will look like. So again, what we've done here is minimize the distance from each of the data points to the line. But it's important to remember that you can get the same regression line for different data. 
right? So y equals x plus four is the same for both the right and left data. You can see that on the left-hand side, this represents a perfect correlation, right? That data falls right on that line. On the right-hand side, this is probably corresponding to, let's say, a positive 0 0.7 correlation, but it still has that same regression line, right? We're still forecasting the same. Questions about any of that so far? Cool. Easy peasy. All right, so the ability of that regression equation to accurately predict y values something we also have to measure. It's not just good enough to give us a regression equation, right? Because you can imagine that what if this data are all over the place, you could still have a best fit line, but it's not necessarily predictive in that case. And so the ability to accurately predict the y values is measured by first computing the proportion of y score variability that's predicted by the regression equation. Are you talking about here? Below that one. Here? Um, residual. Yeah, wow, that didn't uh, come out all that well. So yeah, we're looking at the variability as predicted by the regression equation and the proportion that is not predicted. What is that extra variability? So that predicted variability, we call the sum of squares regression. Which is found by squaring our correlation coefficient, right, getting R squared, and then multiplying that by the sum of squares for the y variable. And the degrees of freedom for the regression uh, variability is always going to be one, at least in this case when we're doing linear regressions. Always going to be one. Um, so the I'm trying to think mathematically. I'm almost positive it's because uh, the, um, like if we go back to, where is this equation here? Uh, with it being linear, you don't have an extra source of um, a variability, right? So if you had a y equals x squared plus four, you're now going to have a different nonlinear relationship that has additional variability inherent in it. Um, so for purposes of what we're doing, all you need to know is that it's just always going to be one. For the unpredicted variability, or that sum of squares residual, you can calculate it two ways. First would be one minus that R squared value. Times the sum of squares Y. And the other would be the sum 
of y, your actual y value, minus your predicted y value squared. So essentially what you'd be doing for the second one here is saying, okay, we know what our predicted y value is for an x of two. What's the difference between that and our actual value? And be squaring it. I tend to think that this first equation is just easier, right? Once you got the correlation coefficient, just square it, subtract it from one, and then multiply that by the sum of squares of y. You've already had to get the sum of squares of y on this top part, so may as well just go with that. And the degrees of freedom for that unpredicted variability is always going to be n minus 2, where n is the number of data pairs you have. So in this case, it would be 5 minus 2 or uh, 3. So the unpredicted variability can be used to compute the standard error of estimate, which is that measure of average distance between the actual values and the predicted values. All right, this equation should look very similar what we've done in the past. So the sum of squares residual divided by the degrees of freedom residual. The square root of that. And then finally, the overall significance of that regression equation is calculated by computing an F ratio. So a significant F ratio in this case is indicating that the equation predicts a significant proportion of the variability in Y scores, which is to say that the regression equation that you get is a fairly good indicator, right? If we're just putting that in lay person's terms, are you able to predict much with that regression equation? So to compute that F ratio, you're going to first calculate a variance for the mean squares for predicted variability and for the unpredicted variability. So that mean squares regression is just going to be the sum of squares regression over the degrees of freedom regression. Right, similar principle, whatever your mean squares of interest is, is just equal to the sum of squares of that interest divided by the degrees of freedom of that interest. And the mean square residual is equal to that sum of squares residual over the degrees of freedom residual. And then your F ratio is the mean squares regression, spelled correctly, not with two eyes over the mean square residuals. You would then look up that F critical value in the back of the book with 
at one and your denominator degrees of freedom being the number of pairs minus two. No, no, so this, so remember in the back of your book, the uh, F table requires a degrees of freedom numerator and a degrees of freedom denominator. And that's what these two degrees of freedom are. And so, yes, exactly, yep. Questions about that? All right. So this is just representing graphically what we've already talked about. That sum of squares y is a function of that sum of squares regression and sum of squares residual. That degrees of freedom y is just a function of the degrees of freedom regression and the degrees of freedom residual. So that is a regression with a single predictor. However, it's the case that almost nothing in life should ever be a univariate analysis. Right? You'll hear this all the time. People in society have kind of a statistical uh, illiteracy, which leads them to want to say, let's compare these two groups or let's compare on this continuum and see what that does for the prediction of uh, this outcome. But in reality, it's usually helpful to add more predictor variables. The more predictor variables you have, the better the predictive capabilities of that regression equation get. All right, so if we wanted to predict what somebody's height was going to be, We could do kind of a univariate analysis and say, okay, how tall is your dad? But there are a lot of external other factors that are gonna influence how tall you're gonna be, right? Not only how tall is your dad, but how tall is your mom? What's the elevation you grew up at? How malnourished were you? Do you have activation of these growth genes? Did you play a lot of sports that were high impact and can have negative impacts on your growth? Things like that. And so in the same way that a linear regression produces an equation that uses values of x to predict y, a multiple regression produces an equation that uses two different variables, say x1 and x2, to predict those values of y. So that equation is determined by at least some, excuse me, a least squared error solution that minimizes, again, those squared distances between the actual y values and the predicted y values. So that's just saying the same thing we did before, right? We want to minimize that distance of that line to the data points it's trying to represent. Nothing new about that. And so what we can do here is represent what are the proportions of shared variance and unique variance. Right? What's the proportion of variance on one's SAT scores that's shared with academic performance? What's the amount of variance 
in academic performance that's shared with variance in IQ. What's the amount of variance that's shared by all three of them? And so for two predictor variables, that general form of multiple regression equation is just y hat equals b1 x1, right? b1 times x1, which is to say our first variable, so let's say dad's height, has its own slope, coefficient rather. Variable two, mom's height, has its own slope um, coefficient. And we still have that singular y-intercept. And so as we did before, the ability of that multiple regression equation to accurately predict those y values is measured by computing the proportion of y score variability as predicted by the regression equation and the proportion that is not predicted. Right? How much extra noise is there in that data? How big is that cloud around that line? So again, that predicted variability would be that sum of squares regression. That should actually be a lowercase r. But r squared is still times the sum of squares y. Now with the degrees of freedom two, because we're adding that second dimensionality to it. And with that unpredicted variability, or that sum of squares residual, still represented by the same equation, right? That one minus the r squared, and again, this should be lowercase two, times that sum of squares y. Now it degrees of freedom n minus three. Our squared value is just B1 times the SP of X1 and Y, <clears throat> right? So you're calculating two of these SP values, one for X1 and Y, the second one for X2 and Y, plus that B2 value that you will have calculated times the SP of X2 and Y. all over that sum of squares y. So again, that F Ratio is the mean squares regression divided by the mean squares residual. And in this case, the degrees of freedom because we have two predictors is two for um, uh, the denominator degrees of freedom, right? The degrees of freedom residual is n minus three in this case. And again, the equation for mean squares is the same as it's always been. 
And so I'm not going to have you all calculate a partial correlation for the exam, but I do want to go over this so you're at least familiar with the concept. So a partial correlation measures the relationship between two variables, x and y, while attempting to eliminate the influence of a third variable. Right, so I've got the correlation between ice cream sales and shark attacks. But now I want to try and eliminate what is the influence of outside temperature on that. Right, we have a sinking suspicion that when we try to control for that third variable, right, that outside temperature, that correlation is going to disappear. Right? But if we're not controlling for that variable, that correlation still may show up and exist, right? And so what we're trying to do is statistically do what we conceptually know we need to do, right? If you see that there's a correlation between the number of cashews somebody eats and how long they live, well, the first question you'd want to ask is maybe, okay, well, how often are they exercising? Or are they eating a lot of cashews because they just eat healthier in general, right? So now we want to try and incorporate that third variable that we think has some predictive value to remove any of the variance which could be explained by that third factor to allow us to know as best we can, <coughs> excuse me, what is the true relationship between those two variables. So anytime you see somebody say there's a relationship between X and Y, or there's a difference between group one and group two on X, Y, or Z, you always wanna say, okay, what are some of those third variables we could start accounting for that could potentially explain all of that variance or at least a good amount of that variance? For example, there's probably no underlying relationship between an elementary school kid's weight and their math skills. However, both these variables are obviously related to age, right? Older children are going to weigh more, but they're also going to do better in math. Now, if we just ran that univariate analysis, we would say, look, heavier kids do better in math class. So should we start force feeding them pizza? Probably not. We want to think about, okay, what are these potential second or third order contributors? And so maybe now we want to control for age, right? How old that kid is. So once we actually hold constant age, Right, so that Z variable in this case would be age, and we are um, essentially factoring out any of the variance associated with that age. It would show that there's really no correlation. Right, we wouldn't expect there to be a correlation. Theoretically, it doesn't make sense for there to be any correlation. But what would show up if we don't control for those other sorts of variables? Can anybody think of any other example where there may be a correlation, but there's a third obvious variable or a third likely variable which could explain it? And then like the shock attack example you always get, like that's not that people are buying ice cream because of shock attacks, but because of because like, I think Oh, you kinda of cut out there, Sonny. Oh, like um that it's because of the weather, not necessarily the relationship between shock attacks and um ice cream. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So that weather is that obvious uh, or seemingly obvious contributor to that, right? So you'll see all sorts of examples in your everyday life that will say, look at this relationship. 
between x and y. Say, okay, well, what other possible explanations are there? And then you'd actually want to go read that study and see, okay, did they try to control for those other effects? Because right? you could find a correlation between a lot of things if you're not controlling for the true cause of those effects. And the really cool thing about these types of regressions and these multiple regressions is this, this is the entire basis for what's known as machine learning, right? When we think about artificial intelligence and computers learning things, pretty much the entire foundation of modern artificial intelligence techniques are based on linear regressions, right? I'm gonna control for a variety of inputs and now I'm gonna create these regression lines, right? I mean, this, so this line, this arrow here is not the actual regression line, but it's representing that line there. Um, and saying, okay, I know I've got inputs and I know I've got outputs. How do these regression line equations need to change such that given a certain input, I can get a certain output, right? And so this input could be every pixel in a picture. And that output could be either cat or dog. Okay. And what does the relationship between these different pixels need to be for me to be able to say, yes, that's a dog. I'm going to classify that picture as a dog. Okay. You can think about kind of inherent differences between the appearance of a cat and between a dog. And so this would just be the process by which you're actually training a computer to do that. Um, yeah, don't worry about that. All right. So let's see, Caleb says. Um, will this be on the final? Will what be on the final? Regressions? Partial correlations? No. So I'm not, um, I may ask you conceptually about partial correlations, but I'm not going to actually ask you to calculate partial correlations. Of course. All right. So on Monday, you have your next exam. This is the first exam for which you are allowed it, allowed it, allowed, say permitted or allowed, um, allowed it a backside of a cheat sheet. So now you can get the front and back of a cheat sheet. Everything else will be pretty similar. The design of this test will be very similar to your last test. Be prepared to calculate a lot of things. Make sure you are showing your work as is possible. I realize it's a little difficult to do so on the exam, but in the same way you had to on exam two, um, do it the same way now so I can give you all a partial credit. If you get the wrong answer and you don't show your uh, work, and you don't get any credit for the points. If you show your work and you're at least on the right path, I'm going to give you some points, right? So make sure you show your work. Questions about the exam? Or anything else? For the last two exams, you've given us like the equations we need. Could you go over those again? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to, but the answer is really going to be just go through the slides and uh, look at every um, equation I give you. Let me pull up the syllabus here. All right, so you're going to need to know um, the equations for analysis of variance, equations for um, everything we've done in between here, I don't remember off the top of my head, but um, each of those should be on the slides. 
Um, since we covered more stuff for this part, are we going to get like extra time or anything like that? Nope. Nope, it'll still be 80 minutes. So, um, Jill, you said. Is the final going to be cumulative like this seminar? No, final will be cumulative. Oh, okay. So yep. Correct. Yep. It will be. Yeah. So um, you won't get more time, but I'm also likely not going to um, ask you on everything. Um, I have a question. There are a lot of equations. Yeah. What's up? Um, so when I was looking, like you, you kind of posted the exam three out there. There's like, there, it's only worth five points. Yeah. Don't worry about that. I'm not done, uh, putting it together. Yet. Okay. <laughs> It'll be okay. worth more than five points. I okay. Cause I was very confused on that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, that, uh, it's best to ignore most of what I do relating to the exam until the exam opens. A lot of it's going to change. Now, let me say, I'm giving you the front and back with the hopes that you're just adding to your existing cheat sheet, because that'll make it really easy for the final. If you wanted to take both front and back for these six lectures, you could do that. But when it comes time to the final, I'm not going to give you any extra pages. And so you want to have front and back with all the equations. And so I'm hoping you just add on to that. And some principles you'll be kind of pulling in from um, earlier concepts, but it should make it a lot easier for when you come time for the final, if you're able to organize it and just build off of one page. What's the final thing uh, for your final um, Because that's our final example. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause it's for longer than the 80 minutes we've got for class. Right? So UH always has that final exam schedule. And so, um, oh, okay, yes. So, um, yep, uh, UH has a final exam schedule that uh, yours just happens to be on a Monday. It could have very easily been on a Tuesday. Um, and then they get a two and a half hour block for that. Um, so I suspect what I'll do is on that day, I'll just open it up at the beginning of the day and let y'all have all day for two and a half hours to take it once you start. Uh, I don't know for sure about that. Um, they gave us kind of specific restrictions um, uh, last spring about that. But I think as long as it's open during that exam time, it doesn't really matter. But um, I'll let you know. Um, yeah, so I will. Um, If you have a specific conflict, let me know. Um, and we'll just work around that on a case by case basis, but I'm going to try to get it. I just don't want to promise that it's going to be open all day and then have administration say, no, you're not allowed to. So plan on it just being at this time. But if you have a specific um, issue, let me know. All right. What other questions? So you were saying that um, you'd recommend us use a previous cheat sheet and just writing on the back of it because we won't have a new one for the final. Is that what you're saying? If we won't be mm -hmm. making another one? Well, so you can make whatever you want to for the final, but you only have those two pages. And so my main point there was if you use both pages for justice exam, uh, it's going to make your life harder when you go time for the final exam, right? And so my suggestion would be that you just keep building off of the last cheat sheet you did. And so the backside is going to be everything from exam two on. Um, but you can do whatever the hell you want. It's your cheat sheet. So oh, if you right, just want to write right, right. positive like, words about edit. it. I see. Edit it down. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. All right.
Well, if there are no other questions, have a good weekend. And uh, let me know if you have questions before the exam. Otherwise, the exam will open at uh, 12.01 on Monday morning and run through 11.59 Monday evening.